Hey everybody, welcome back. Chad with Patriot Astro. Here I am visiting family for the first time in a very long time, and I decided to bring my portable telescope rig. The problem I have in this location is that I have a series of obstructions that are going to prevent me from seeing a good portion of the night sky. More specifically, can I actually select targets that are going to be visible to me throughout the evening? In this video, I'm going to show you to create a horizon line, import it into Nina, and have it overlay on top of your Sky Atlas results so that you can properly select objects that are visible in your location. I'll also show you how to use this same series of data within CART to CL and even Stellarium so that you can use it there for target selection. Unfortunately, in this location, I don't have a great view of Polaris. As a matter of fact, I don't have any view at all. This direction is true north. There's a large tree in my way, and I'm actually obscured from my horizon in multiple directions. So as I rotate here, you can see what I'm faced with. So I'm going to do a quick demo of how I can obtain this data using an app on my iPhone called the Autolite, which is a surveyor's instrument. There are several other apps for both iPhone and Android that you can use. But this is the one I'm going to show you today. So you can see I'm pointing true north and the compass readings at the bottom. I'm around two degrees uh, and I'll bounce back and forth right as I move my phone around a little bit here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up in this location around true north and notice on the right hand side of the screen I'm getting an altitude rating that'll go up just above 50 degrees when I'm at the top of my obstruction. I'll click log and click add data to plot that point. Then I'll rotate to the right and continue to plot my horizon, wherever my obstructions are blocking me, I want to add a data point in that location. And again, each one of these data points is going to plot both my compass heading based on true north and the altitude at that point. You'll notice I'm padding it a little bit. These readings are not going to be perfect, right? My phone is moving around a little bit. When I get to trees and tree lines, certainly those will leaf out in the summer and go bare in the winter. So this is not perfect but it is going to help me quite a bit and we'll see how it can help you in a few applications. So again, I'll go all the way around. When I get back to 360, I'll go ahead and copy this and save the data. Before we look at the data that was output by that tool, I wanna to show you how you can create this data set yourself manually just using your hands. So here on the screen, I'm showing you some rules of thumb, pun possibly intended, that you can use when measuring the night sky. If you understand math and trigonometry, you probably realize this is not perfect math. Everyone's arm lengths are different, hand sizes are different, etc. So your mileage may vary. I'm really just going to focus on the fist at arm's length. That's 10 degrees and should get you close enough in your approximations when building your own horizon file. The reality is you're never going to get this perfect. Trees change size, they grow, they lose their leaves, a lot of different things happen throughout the seasons. So all we want to do is come up with a pretty good approximation that helps us make intelligent decisions throughout the evening. So I'm just going to back up here and show you how to do this approximation when taking your own measurements. Your fist should be 10 degrees. So if I'm using my fist here, 10 degrees from top to bottom, and I want this to be as horizontal as possible. So there's 10 degrees from the bottom to the top. There's another 10, so 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Now that's really not too bad. I'm just about overhead. That's about 90 degrees. So what I can do is start at zero or true north, take my approximation. Again, do a little math. If I'm halfway through the fist, that's about five degrees, 30, 35 degrees, whatever it happens to be. I take my measurement, write it down. So I know at zero, I've got 35 degree altitude obstruction. And then I rotate until my obstruction changes, right? So I'm going to basically have this line that goes around as I spin in this location. And again, I want to do this from the location where the mount is. And ideally, you'd like to do it from the height of the mount. But the reality is, depending on the distance of your obstructions, it's not going to matter all that much. Again, we're just trying to get close. Where preciseness can be helpful is if you use Nina's advanced sequencer, because we can make imaging decisions, basically start time and end time, based on that horizon file. If I'm only using this for target selection, if I know it's close, I can use that as part of my personal decision-making process when looking at the data in front of me. Okay, so let's look at the data. I've emailed the data to myself in my Gmail account, and you'll see I have this data set here. So I'm just going to copy that, and I'm going to go into Google Sheets. You can certainly do this in Excel as well. I'm going to paste that data here. Now, what you'll notice, at least with Google Sheets, is that everything landed in the A column. So in A1, I have my headings. 
And then all of the other data points are the rows below that. Now, what I need to do, though, is break this out um, by specific columns. So I have the information where I need it. So what I can do is to go to data, split text to columns, and then change it to be space delimited. And you'll see when I do this, it broke all of the information out appropriately into columns. And the two columns we really care about here are HDG degree, which is our azimuth, and we'll relabel that here as AZ, and then our vert column, which is our altitude, and I'll just write that as ALT. Now, all of the other data that comes out of that particular tool I just showed you on my iPhone is unnecessary. So we'll go ahead and select all the other columns here. So we'll select the first uh, five or six columns here. And then I'll right click and go ahead and delete those columns, A through G. And then uh, we'll go ahead and delete the two columns uh, in between the azimuth and altitude readings. And then I'll delete the data at the end as well. We don't need any of that. So what we should end up with here is just two columns, one with azimuth reading, right? So our compass headings and one with our altitude at that compass heading location. Now you'll notice it's not in order. Um, I must have gone past 360 at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in order by selecting my data and then going to data sort range by column. So I'm going to sort it by my azimuth. I'm going to sort range by column A. And what that will do is reorder all of this information so that I start at one and go all the way down to somewhere in the 300s, 326 in this case. Now that I've got my data sorted from lowest azimuth reading to highest, there are two things we need to do to clean up the file. Notice here I'm changing my initial one degree reading to zero. Most applications that use horizon files want you to start at true north or zero. So I'm just going to adjust that by the one degree. Now I'm going to look for duplicate entries. Now I've got one at 73 and 74. That's fine. But notice I have two entries at a compass heading of 142 degrees. One at 43 degrees altitude, the other at 28. Let's look back and see what happened. Notice the first one was at the top corner of the house where I was at 43 degrees altitude. And then I came down in a straight line and landed at 28 degrees. That's going to be a little problematic in some interpretations of this file. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to move the bottom one over one degree so that it goes from 142 to 143. Looking at the rest of my data, everything else is in order. There's no more duplicates. I'm good. So I'm just going to file, download, and then comma separated values. So this will give me a CSV file. So it'll give me data points separated by commas. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And you'll notice at the bottom of your browser, you have the file that's been downloaded to your downloads folder. I'm going to go ahead and close out of this app, and I'm going to go into the um, file system here. And in my downloads folder, notice I do have the file that was downloaded. It is a CSV file. So let's go ahead and edit this, and it'll open up in Notepad on my computer. And notice that all my data is here, including the header, and that everything is separated by a comma. I need to get rid of those. So in Notepad, I'm going to go up to Edit and then Replace. And what I'm going to do is find commas and replace them with a space. I'll select replace all once that's configured and notice all of my commas are gone and they've been replaced with spaces. So I now have a space delimited file. The other thing I want to do is I want to either get rid of my top line or put a pound sign in front of it that will make that a comment so it won't be interpreted incorrectly by applications trying to use this horizon file. So now my file is ready to go, but it's still a CSV file. Notice that my file name doesn't show me the .csv at the end. If you see this in Windows, you can simply go up to View, Options, View again, and then uncheck Hide Extensions for Known File Types. That'll cause the CSV portion of the file extension to be displayed so that I can change it. So I'm going to change the whole file name, and here I'm just going to call it loc name. You can name it anything you want, but it's location name underscore, and I'll just call it horizon, period, HRZ. And it's important you put the HRZ at the end for Nina. So it'll warn me that I'm changing the type of file. I say OK. Notice now it's listed as an HRZ file, and you can change your options back if you want, but I'm going to leave mine configured this way. So now I'm ready to go into Nina. So let's open Nina up. When Nina opens, you'll notice I'm running 1.11 nightly. It works in other versions as well, but here you can see my auto update sources nightly and that I have my Sky Atlas image folder defined. If you don't have this configured, what you need to do is go to the Nina website, go to download, scroll past the 1.10, 1.11, the betas, um, and go all the way to the bottom and you'll see the link for the Sky Atlas image repository. Download that and extract it on your computer. 
then come back into Nina and tell Nina the location of those extracted files. We'll also come down here and now select our custom horizon. This is the HRZ file we've created and renamed. I'll select that and open it. Now we've applied our horizon file to Nina. To verify it, we'll go to the Sky Atlas and I'll just do a generic search. Notice our results come up and let's take a moment to explain altitude charts and how they work. So here is a simple altitude chart and we're gonna go through it piece by piece here. So on the left, you have altitude from zero to 90 degrees, zero being your real horizon, 90 being zenith directly overhead. Along the bottom, we have a clock. It's a 24 hour clock, starts at noon, ends at noon with midnight in the middle, now there are two times of interest on this chart. On the left is now, that's a very thin line from top to bottom that will track current time. On the right, you see a dot along the graphed altitude for this particular object at 82 degrees. This is where the meridian flip will take place. So this is when the object crosses the meridian. That's going to be its peak altitude uh, this evening. Um, whether it says transit north or transit south has to do with what side of zenith it crosses the meridian. So if you're looking directly overhead, in this particular case, this object will cross the meridian between the zenith and north. If it said transit south, it would be between south and zenith along the meridian. Now what we're looking at here is nighttime. That's the darkest portion of the graph with two vertical bands on both the left side and the right side of nighttime. So the darkest part in the middle is astronomical dark. That's when we prefer to image, right? It's when the sky is at the darkest point. Now, if we're moving along the timeline from left to right, you'll notice we'll hit the band on the left first. And the first line we hit is going to be sunset followed by a short period before we reach nautical dusk, and then eventually astronomical dusk, which is when we hit the darkest point. At the end of the night, we're going to hit astronomical dawn, then nautical dawn, and then finally sunrise before we hit daytime. Now, this other remaining portion of the graphic obviously therefore is daytime. That's everything else. This path here is the altitude of the target. Now it only shows up when the altitude is above the true horizon or zero degrees. You'll notice for this target, if you look at 2100 hours, that's when we come above zero degrees and that is before astronomical dark hits. And then we eventually peak and then come back down on the other side. This here is highlighting the custom horizon. So this gets very important when you start to look at the altitude chart because now we can see zero degrees isn't really what's important to us. It's actually the altitudes of all of the objects that are obstructing our view. So in this case, even though we hit zero degrees and come above the horizon with this target at about 2100 hours, it's not until about 2300 hours or 11 p.m. before we get above our obstruction for the evening and that can become important for target selection and sequencing. So let's jump back into Nina and take a look at a couple more of these. You can see our horizon is overlaid on top of all of the results and it'll look a little bit different depending on what we're looking at. The first one I want to drill into though is an object that never comes above our horizon. So even though it makes it to 18 degrees it never gets beyond our tree line. Now in this particular case we are above our horizon when AstroDoc starts, but we fall below our horizon before the end of the evening, so we may want to stop imaging early. So let's go ahead and just select one of these and we'll add it to a sequence and we'll see what we can do with this information inside the advanced sequencer. So here I'll go to my sequencer and I'll choose one of my saved sequences. I'll probably do a video in the future on these sequences and even share them if possible. So let's see how we can use this data. Well here's an instruction where we can ask the system to wait until we're above the horizon based on the horizon line and the target selection that we see in the upper right hand corner. Now let's see another instruction that allows us to use the custom horizon. And in this case, we're gonna look at an imaging sequence and a looping condition. So here we see that we have a condition that says loop while altitude above horizon. So we're gonna to continue to run this loop until our object falls below the horizon, at which point we'll stop. So you can see there are a number of very interesting ways to use the custom horizon, both within sequences and for target selection. 
Now let's take a look and see how this horizon line can be applied to cart to cl which some of you may be using as your planetarium software. So within cart to cl we're going to go into setup and then observatory and you need to have your location set up correctly obviously but what we'll do is we'll click on horizon and then we'll say display the local horizon line and we'll browse and find our hrz file now it wants it to be in this specific folder right within cl data horizon so what I'm going to do is open up the folder on my computer that contains this file, right? It's in the downloads folder currently, and I'm just going to copy it from here, and then I'll paste it into this dialog box within cart to cl to make sure that it ends up in the right location so that cart to cl can use it. Once it's there, I can select it and click open, and it will populate the appropriate field. Now we'll look at showing objects below the horizon and some other things here in a minute. But right now, let's just go ahead and um, apply this, right? We can click apply and then click OK. And immediately you can see the effects on the screen. Our horizon has been applied to the view within cart to CL. So if I zoom out and point directly up at the zenith, you can see that's my overhead view, and I can see all of the obstructions. Um, if I spin this around here and you look at north, you can see my highest obstruction is that large tree to the north. And then if you follow that around to the northeast and then east, you can see the roof lines, right? The lower roof line, the upper roof line, where it then tails off to the south, and then the lower tree line before we come back all the way to the north. So we can see that it's applied here, and now I can use this for target selection within cart to cl and again this is the same exact hrz file we used in nina we just needed to move it to the appropriate location and then add it to the configuration if you want to see what's below your tree line just go back into the observatory setup and check the checkbox for show object below the horizon when you do this what it'll do is actually show everything below the horizon but still maintain a uh, slight shadow where your obstruction line is, your horizon line is. Now, I don't prefer this view. I think it gets a little confusing um, for my tastes. But again, if you do want to see what's below the horizon and still maintain that custom horizon line, it is something you can do within Cart Do CL. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing within Stellarium. I know a number of you use Stellarium as your planetarium software. So let's take a look there. So I'll just open it up and expand it. And the first thing we want to do before we go any further is I need to move some files around. So what we're going to do is open up File Manager and go find our HRZ file, which is in our Downloads folder. And I'm going to copy that file. Then I'm going to go into my C drive. And within the C drive, I'll go to Program Files. I'll go to Stellarium. Within Stellarium, I'm looking for the Landscapes folder, so I'll find the Landscapes folder. And from here, we can see all of the available landscapes. I'm going to go create a new folder here, and we're just going to call it Test Horizon. So I'll name that and save it. Now I have a new empty folder in this location. Now I'm immediately going to go inside Test Horizon, and I'm going to paste the Horizon file we created earlier. So now that's in the appropriate location. There is one other file that Stellarium needs, though, and that is an INI file. The easiest way to get that is to go back to your Landscapes folder, open up any other landscape. I'm going to open Geneva, and then copy the Landscape INI from this location, go back to our newly created Test Horizon folder, and paste this INI here. Now we're going to have to modify this file, but it's easier than creating it from the ground up. So I'll just quickly verify I'm in the Test Horizon folder. I have my two files here. And what I'm going to do is copy the name of this file. If you can remember the name of the file and just want to type it out later, that's fine. I'm just going to put that in my buffer. But the next thing I need to do is edit this INI file. Now to do that, I'm going to open Notepad. But I need to do that with admin rights. So if you search in the bottom left for Notepad, it'll come up and you'll see open. But if you click that down arrow, you find run as administrator. And that's really what we want to do here to make sure we have the appropriate rights to save the changes to this file. So now that I'm running Notepad as an administrator, I can do file open, go to my Test Horizon folder, make sure I'm looking at all files, select my landscape INI and open it. 
So now we're looking at the landscape INI file, and I'm going to go ahead and change the name from Geneva because that's where we copied it from to Test Horizon or whatever you want it to be. You can change the author name. Here I'll put Patriot Astro. You can change the description if you want to change the description as well. But the real important line you need to change here is the horizon list. And this is where I'm going to put the name of my HRZ file. Again, you can type it out. I had it copied, so I just pasted it here. And it says loc name underscore horizon dot HRZ. You can delete the location section at the end of the file. It's not necessary for our purpose here. There are a lot of other things you can do with Stellarium in this file, but again, all I'm trying to do is show you how to get your custom horizon in place within Stellarium. So once that file's saved, we can come back here in Stellarium. We can go back to the Sky and View options, select the Landscape option, and notice now Test Horizon is listed here. If I select this, immediately my Horizon file is applied to the background view on the screen. So we have a few options here. Uh, let's just take a look at what we have. Uh, again, I'm doing this during the daytime, but you can see that if I go forward in time and again, look up at the zenith and zoom out, we can see our horizon file is applied. Everything that is obstructed is blacked out and all we can see is what's available directly overhead based on that horizon. And again, to the north, we see the tree. If we continue around towards the east, we'll see the roof lines. And then along the south, I have a little bit more visibility. Now, if I want to go in and look below the horizon like I did in cart to cl I can do that again. I just come back into the same screen we edited before and say draw only polygon and I can even increase the thickness of that line from one to four. And you can see I still have my horizon line, but I do have visibility below the horizon in this particular case. So let's just take a look and make sure this applied correctly. If I scroll over to north, I can find Polaris and you'll notice where Polaris happens to be on the screen is where my high tree line is, right? So it's the highest obstruction that I have in my path. So here you can see Polaris and it's right behind that tree. Uh, additionally, if I go up and click a star just to get some coordinates up towards that uh, obstruction, notice it's at about 51 degrees. That's where my obstruction was right around um, true north. So that's pretty close to what I'd expect. And then again, if I follow that around, I come down the tree line, if you remember, and then I go along the roof line and then up along the straight upper roof line. And then I come down and you remember that's where we had to modify uh, a couple points in our file. Uh, if you remember up here, we were up around 42 degrees. And then if I came down directly, I was around 28 degrees. Yep, so this all matches exactly what I had configured in the file. And then again, as I continue to spin around, I'll eventually come back to north, which is my highest obstruction. So now within Stellarium, moving forward, you'll be able to know whether or not a target is obtainable based on your location. Hopefully you found this helpful and it's something you can put into practice immediately. As always, like, subscribe, and share, and we hope to see you back soon. Clear skies.